Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I want to touch base on a more philosophical topic today, and that is how am I so able to consistently outperform the S&P 500? I couldn't have started with a more cockier statement than that. I'm also going to want to touch base on some of the different sectors in the market as things begin to rally back, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Anybody that bought stocks over the last week, congratulations. Not that this rally is going to continue, but it is nice to see a little bit of green in our portfolios. Now, before I get into that, I want to touch a base on something that I think is actually related to this, and that is you guys asking my opinions on some individual stocks you're interested in and why I think that is such a terrible idea. And I'm going to give you an example of this because Alfredo asked me what my opinion on STOR and MPW were. And this is just about as much as I'm going to be able to tell you. For example, if we look up STOR, we can see it trades at a 14 PE. It's a $4 billion company with an 8% dividend yield, making it look rather attractive. If I deep dive any farther, we can find out this is a leasing company. Warren Buffett actually owns 10% of the outstanding shares. I can get into their presentation that shows us their exposure to say manufacturing, retail and services. Mind you, they have a rather large exposure in my opinion to restaurants, which probably aren't performing that well through this economic situation. And if I go even farther into their balance sheet, I could tell you guys that they have an incredible debt to asset ratio with a total assets of 8.2 billion. Total liability of 3.8 billion means their trading market cap is extremely close to their underlying asset value. And the last five year performance has been unbelievable. But should you buy that stock on what I just told you? Absolutely not, guys. That took me all of five minutes to find, and that is just not enough information, in my opinion, for somebody that is buying individual stocks. And I only hold 14 stocks. I have been investing for just going on six years now. And over that six year period, it's kind of incredible to think about how under diversified I am or how a lot of people tell me I'm under diversified. But if anything, I think I'm even over diversified. And I'm going to explain this further along with breaking down my personal performance. And then we're going to touch base on some of these sectors within the market. So ladies, gentlemen, let's jump right into this. Drop it. <laughs> back about passive income investors alike on why I think I'm so capable of outperforming the S&P 500. And I think it has a lot to do with my comfortability level in these different sectors of the market and even holding individual stocks. Because a lot of you guys are going to go out and you're probably going to listen to the investor community and you're going to go ahead and purchase some of those world-renowned stocks, things like Coca-Cola. You're probably talking about McDonald's, I mean, O-Realty Income. And you'd probably be comfortable doing that. But I am not comfortable unless I understand to a certain degree about a company. And on top of that, it's not just understanding a company, it's how passionate I am about that individual company. Building personal passion around a brand and a company isn't something that simply happens overnight, guys. And taking a look at my performance chart here, I'm waiting for the March performance to come in, but going into February, when things just started to decline, I'm still confident that I'm well outperforming the S&P 500. But over this five, six year period, I 100% returned most of my accounts, which means I average about a 20% return on a yearly basis, obviously over a five-year term. Some years were rockier than others. But the reason that I think this has happened is because I only stick to such a small handful of companies. And those companies, in my opinion, give me enough diversification. I like what Warren Buffett said about sticking to your realm of competency. And I'm honestly one of those people that would not sleep easy at night owning an ETF. Because even Warren Buffett says, you know, like an ETF is a tool against ignorance. And I don't want that to be said is a bad statement. I don't think there's anything wrong with holding an index fund if that is what makes you comfortable. But I do not sleep easy at night knowing I'm holding something like a Vanguard index fund. Every morning I get up and I scroll through my stocks on my stock list uh, forum, I always get this bubbly feeling inside knowing that these are my top tier companies. These are companies that I'm going to be able to take to retirement with me and I'm extremely passionate about all of them. So let's start with the REIT sector, guys. Considering I only hold two REITs over the last six years of my investing career. I've looked at everything from retirement homes. I've been looking at data centers. Heck, I've been looking at just about every REIT that possibly exists out there only to buy two. Now, why did that happen? Well, let's start with RioCan as an example here, guys. RioCan is a stock I have been analyzing literally almost since the beginning of my investment days. And as I've learned and watched their presentations, listened to the CEO, I've come to really understand their tenants. I drive by their real estate on a daily basis. And something happened over time. I started getting butterflies. And when I get butterflies about something, I become a lot more passionate.
passionate about it and then I start doing deeper work and then before you know it, it becomes a ten, fifteen thousand dollars position in my portfolio. And when I compare it to other REITs, I mean, I see some similarities, but there's things that stick out to me that don't fit my philosophy and my circumstances and conditions I require to buy that specific stock. For example, I would love to buy something like an O Realty income, but I have my tax advantaged accounts max. And for me to purchase something like an O Realty income, the dividend yield is rather low. And considering I'm a Canadian citizen, I would have to pay over the border withholding tax, which is 15%. So not only am I not buying in a tax advantaged account, I would have to pay over the border tax, which means that dividend income would get cut by about 35 to 40%. And that is an incredible rate that I would love to buy. But for that reason, I'm just not buying it. Now let's use something like GEO Group as an example. My only US REIT that I hold pays an incredibly large dividend being in the prison sector, an extremely unappealing uh, aspect of the real estate market. But why do I love it so much? Well, this company was almost like a game of chess to me. It's the ugliest real estate you could ever own, but it's extremely well diversified. They have tenants that are never leaving and taxpayers primarily pay for those people to be there. And I feel like it's a sector of the market that's just not going anywhere anytime soon. And that is one of the reasons this dividend yield is so high is because of the unappealing nature of the whole company. And on top of that, the reason I like it is because the dividend yield is so high. I have it in a tax advantaged account, so I'm stuck paying withholding tax, but I'm not stuck paying income tax on it. So to lose 15% of that dividend isn't really going to hurt me in the long run, but I've come to really grasp what that company's doing, where they're going, what the ins and outs are. In fact, I even got an email from somebody that wanted to use my footage I made on that company in a Netflix special, though I kind of denied them because I know they're just going to be battering that company. Those are stocks that don't ever appeal well in the news, but they appeal well to me. I just sleep really easy at night holding that company for my specific circumstances. And when I compare it to other REITs and look at the performance, there's just things that I don't grasp, things that I don't understand. So look, all these things come into play and it gets really overwhelming, guys. And let me give you an example about why I think even you are over diversifying. Do you treat your portfolio the same way you treat your working career? Do you have multiple sources of income from your applied work? Not your stock portfolio, just your applied job. My guess is you don't. My guess is you probably show up to one job, you take that job income and you invest it and you live on it. That's not very diversified. You better hope your company has diversified income to protect your job. And I don't understand why people are so comfortable with that, but they're not comfortable with just holding a few companies within their portfolio. Because taking a look at something like RioCan, it is giving me exposure to some of the top tier tenants out there. And on top of that, I'm getting exposure to hundreds of pieces of real estate across different provinces in Canada. Why do I need more exposure than that? Those 14 companies I hold make up trillions of dollars, hundreds of thousands, of employees. Why do I need more than that? It's, it's a serious question here, guys, because I look at a lot of people on M1 Finance and Robinhood, and they seem comfortable holding 40 or 50 different companies, but they don't mind showing up to their one job that is severely undiversified, but they understand their job well, and they're comfortable showing up to it. And in my opinion, I want to be so comfortable and so passionate about these individual companies that I hold, I get the same feeling behind my work that I do. When I get the same feeling from my actual applied job to my individual companies that I'm buying, I know I'm making the right investment decision. And I'm primarily believing that is one of the main reasons my portfolio outperforms because you don't need 30 or 40 companies in your portfolio. You could be like a PPC in, and I'm sure as your portfolio expands, I think that's the right amount of diversification for me with the amount of money that I have. Obviously, as my portfolio grows, I am going to be adding more positions slowly, but surely, but those are the circumstances circumstances that fit my risk tolerance level. And let me take a look at a different sector of the market that I think is a really good exemplifier of why I just don't buy every best stock I hear about. Let's take a look at oil, for example, guys. I know a lot of people that are severely comfortable with oil, buying a lot of oil stocks right now, but let me share with you one of the primary reasons I have I don't like the oil sector. So take a listen to this uh, news report. We did a conference call with the Saudi ambassador. There were, I think, nine of, nine of the 13 did a conference call. That Becky, I got to tell you, was as candid a call uh, and and direct a call as I've ever had with a foreign leader. Where the nine of us, I mean, we quite frankly unloaded on her, and 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 their defense was essentially, well, but Russia, but Russia is doing this, and I can tell you my response. I said, well, that's fine, but Russia is not our friend. We know they're not our friend, and we treat them accordingly. We are aware. Their intentions to us are malign. The Saudi kingdom is supposed to be our friend, and we are a military ally, we are a diplomatic ally, and you are not behaving like a friend when you are trying to destroy 
thousands and thousands of small businesses all across Texas and the country. And, and so the senators on the call with the ambassador urged vigorously, and we said, listen, there are a whole series of steps we can take to escalate foreign policy pressure. We outlined a number of them. If you continue engaging in economic warfare against the United States, trying to drive down the price of oil in order to, to, to exploit this crisis, to drive a bunch of American okay. producers out of business, I'm hopeful. Taking a look at the global scale and impact oil has on the economy and listening to a conversation like this sounds like a bunch of little kids. It sounds like the U.S. Oh, you're my friend. You're not supposed to do this. I, we're not friends with Putin. Putin has nothing to do with it. Like listening to that doesn't make me sleep comfortably at night. And I do not want to own a sector of the market that has that kind of reality behind it where people can come in and manipulate it. There's no real price control over anything. And it makes it very unstable going forward because you just don't know what happens to the oil price. I mean, they could get control of Saudi and the price could skyrocket. Saudi might keep giving everyone the middle finger and say, no, I'm going to bankrupt you all and I can afford to do it. I mean, it's just, it's such a weird political child yelling game. I don't want to be exposed to a product like that. I like being exposed to my few products and don't get me wrong. I don't understand my products to like a hundred percent extent. I mean, go take a look at like a balance sheet on a bank. I mean, that is so unbelievably complicated, but I use these banks. I understand the Jiffy Lube of the banks, you know, like the fact that their mortgages, interest rates are down, so they're probably not making as much money. They make money off ATM fees. I mean, I understand some of their fee structure, but if I was to be honest here and tell you I understand 100% the banks that I hold, I'd be lying. I don't, but I'm comfortable with the level of knowledge I have behind them to hold them. I am not comfortable with that same knowledge behind the oil sector. There's just too many variants that don't make sense. The oil sector is not backed by the Canadian Treasury or the US Federal Reserve like the banks are. There's just a lot of other circumstances that come into play. Now, when you take a look at all these different sectors and these few companies that I hold, guys, I can just ding it off the top of my head. I understand them quite well. I understand my tobacco giants, British American Tobacco. We're talking about um, Altria Group. I mean, if we're talking about utilities. My Northland Power has incredible diversification and expansion in Germany. We're talking about they're trying to expand into like, I think Japan. We got Southern companies dealing with some new uh, nuclear facilities that are coming online. Like, I can just name this stuff off the top of my head. And like I said, every day I scroll through that stock list, it is a lot easier for me to understand the diversification I have in these 14 companies than it is to understand, you know, having 50 companies or an entire ETF. Though, again, I'm not saying that that might be your comfortability level. And let me know in that comment section below, are you more comfortable holding uh, ETFs? Are you comfortable diversifying your Robinhood or M1 finance account with 50 or 100 stocks only having maybe five or 10 grand in the account. And I'd love to know your performance on that, guys. I'd be, I'd be very interested to find out. But when I can understand these companies in a much more condensed manner, and I can understand where they're going, I get a better performance overall. And I mean, Warren Buffett always said, if you could only hold 20 stocks in your entire life, chances are you're gonna take your sweet time understanding those 20 stocks. And like I said, guys, I've spent six years investing. Mind you, there's companies that I used to hold that I don't hold anymore for whatever specific reason. But over this six year period, I've only built out an entire portfolio of 14 stocks. I mean, you guys have probably only been investing for a year and your heads are against the wall and you're probably just buying everything. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It just doesn't fit my philosophy for investing. But I would love to know as always what you guys think about this in that comment section below. So stay cool, stay awesome, and I look forward to chatting to you tomorrow.